Hello, my beautiful friends. My name is Maggie. You might know me from Maggie Maybe Reading over on TikTok, but I made this specific venture on YouTube because I wanted to start this series called Making Mischief. It's a combined effort a bit between Maggie Maybe Reading and my social media consulting company, uh, Moments in Mayhem. So it's kind of presented by the two of them. And it's all about emerging authors on BookTok most or emerging authors on social media in general but mostly these new authors who I and creators who I've met through BookTok who have had this huge support in writing their first books and just having such success uh, before they've even actually had a book out but what that's like to have this whole support system cheering you on how they went about self-publishing getting an editor finding book cover art mostly just to give like a how-to a bit for new authors people who want to make that dream happen and not really they don't really know where to start I was really excited just to talk about their stories these friends that I have who have these incredible imaginations and just have crafted these really beautiful stories and wanted to have those organic chats with them that I like to have regardless, but I wanted you guys to be able to be a fly on the wall as well. I was thinking about turning this into a podcast. I do have the audios for all of them. We'll see. I really like the visual aspect of us interviewing each other, so I'll keep you posted. Uh, but each each episode will have a new author that I'm talking to. If you have anybody writing something that you'd really like to hear more about what they're doing, please ping me and I'll reach out to them and we'll try and make that happen. Um, but yeah, I hope you guys look enjoy this first episode. Hi guys, uh, welcome back to my channel. As you might know, I am Maggie from Maggie May Be Reading on TikTok. And today I'm, I've just started recently this new series that I love called Making Mischief. And through book talk, you know, I met a ton of creators who I really loved, who loved stories just as much as I did, but I also realized there are a ton of creators making stories of their own, and they kind of have this entire community backing them as they are writing their first books, and I, I just think it's so cool, and so I get to talk to one of my favorite people who is one of those creators today, Miss Samantha. Hello, Samantha. Hello, Maggie. How's it You're going? <laughs> Um, I'm over the moon right now, but more than anything, I love seeing you in your element. Like you were so elegant in that introduction. So thank you for having me. Oh, absolutely. Thanks. Um, I would love for you to just start telling me a little bit about what brought you to Book Talk. And then were you writing before you came on Book Talk? Did it help encourage you to write more? Kind of what's that in like origin story? So it's a little long winded, but I'll shorten it because I've gotten pretty comfortable with explaining it since the year that I started writing this book. So I first came to Book Talk because I was already on TikTok during the pandemic, but I had a different page under my, under just a different username in which I was doing like sketch comedy videos with my mom that was much more for like the Latin demographic, like more like the like first generation demographic. Um, but then I was moving back and forth between California and, and Florida. And so I didn't have access to my mom that much. Making those videos kind of made me feel really sad because I just didn't have I didn't have my like partner in crime anymore. And this is also around the same time that I started coming across like Caitlin, I'm forgetting her entire username, but it's the beautiful girl in TikTok who has the room full of books, like the triangle shaped room full of books. Yes. Um, her and I just was so taken aback because I think I grew up during a time of Tumblr which which like we guess we both did where I had Tumblr and stuff, but I was a big reader all throughout high school, middle school and some of college, but I didn't have anyone in my friend circle who was also like that. So coming across someone who that was there, I mean, she has multiple parts to herself, but I was just interacted with that form of her identity. And I just felt very seen in a way that felt very safe and comforting, comforting. And so I decided to make a fake channel and I say fake channel because I made up a pseudonym. I had never, I made up a, a like a code name, if you will, Literary Libra. I had never used that any, anywhere before. That was never like a username I went to. And um, I was reading this book series that everyone kept talking about on the cha on the on book talk called Throne of Glass. And I just didn't have any friends that read. And so I used it as a place where I could just like share my feelings. And within the first week of that, because I had just finished reading A Court of Thorns and Roses, which I picked up from the app. So I was like, okay, these people have taste. Um, I found all these people who also wanted friends who were reading that. And that quickly morphed into the hashtag Literary Libra Book Club. 
and that's how I met you and that's yeah, how I met you me. actually started throne of glass like doing your reaction videos as soon as I finished the series and I was like and that's how I like I remember finding you as you were reacting to like air of fire and I was just like that that like kicked off this whole thing and I love that I found you that early well it's same though because when I was talking to you like you were like we are both under 10k at that point and yeah. now look at you like it's look absurd at you. Oh, thank you. But I love seeing you shine and I love seeing your platform grow. And we've talked about this over DM, but you are one of the people on Book Talk that has diversified your content in a way that keeps Book Talk alive, but also shows all the aspects of your personality, which I truly respect. Um, and it's gorgeous and I really admire you. Um, but basically I met you through there and Long story short, in terms of like, so that's how I found book talk, how I started writing. So I've been a writer my whole life, but in different ways. So when I was in middle school and elementary school, I was a prose writer. I like, I was that nerd in elementary school who like, in middle school, who started the writing club. And all that meant was that I'd show up to school an hour early every day and just sit in my English teacher's classroom and write in my journal. And the reason I bring that up is because, so I started off in prose, I would write plays and stuff. And then I went into, went into college and became a filmmaker. And so I was writing a lot of scripts and I completely neglected prose, but going back in time to the pandemic. So when I was in middle school, I was working every day on this like concept of a book and I would like physically handwrite it in a journal. Mm-hmm. And I'm home for the pandemic. I'm DMing with a friend of mine. I had just finished reading Grown of Glass and getting back into fantasy. And I was talking to my friend and I was like, you know, a dream of mine had always been that I want to create my own lore. And I started reminiscing about this book that I started when I was in middle school and how this is a sad story that's going to have a happy ending. I actually got 256 or 36 pages into writing that book. And I deleted all of it when I was 16. I know, I know. I know you and my whole family and <laughs> just like, but- um, He said, every, nope. <laughs> no, I just like, I don't know. I was just getting bullied at the time for it. And it just like, it was coming in from all sides. And so I was like, you know, kids are mean. And, and it was weird. So I just deleted it. And the only thing I wanted from it was I was like, you know what? Just for the nostalgia purposes, I would love it if I can find those journals and because I hand wrote it and so I was cleaning out my bookcase like in my childhood room middle of the pandemic 2020 what the hell is happening with my life and I came across the journal signed and dated you wrote those down this is why like I do love handwritten work Mm -hmm. but yeah yeah I'm very grateful for that that is so wild I love I mean I love that you have brought back like in a way reading kind of brought back my inner child when I went back onto book talk and yours like physically you took that writing from your child yes. like developing it and I'm really excited so if, if you guys don't know we're talking today about Samantha's book uh the poppy fields of Diagmar am I saying that right you are and it's actually very cool to hear you say it so <laughs> I'm so glad. Um, yeah, and I so I kind of do this at the beginning for everybody, and I'm I will give you if in 15 seconds you have to pitch your book. How do you pitch it in 15 seconds? Like your little elevator pitch. I will start your timer now. Go. Every overachiever in life has this like belief and faith that they are going to be better than the community they came from that at the end of the day, their sense of pride is going to make it out and they will become great. What if your day comes that is stripped from you and gifted to your little sister? What is going to become of the rest of your life? Oh, shit. (laughs) that's good okay okay wait you were ready you were ready for that question I was about to because I I have fumbled over this question so yeah I was about to say, because I do ask, I remember um, if I was in this scenario, I would just be like, uh, uh, and I would just start yelling things. So that was much more eloquent. Thank you for that. Um, But uh, tell us a little bit, like I I will, I do want to get into our characters, but first tell us about the world. Tell us the the world you you, you built. So I, in, in the least creepy way, I've always been obsessed with the concept of just cults, like cult worship. Yeah. 
and like from the small to the big like just like indoctrination and just um the belief of something bigger than yourself even if you don't really see it and so I wanted base like foundation of the magic system I wanted it to be centered around that like a society cut off from outside points of view and how would that grow like how do you grow society in a nutshell like one of my biggest like inspirations comes from like the lord of the flies Mm -hmm. um like in terms of classic literature like how like you can strip everything down to its bare bones but society will still create itself and so first of all that's why it's in a village in the middle of the woods um and now I'm stumbling so and and then when I wanted to go into like a power system or just like what type of creatures these people were I didn't necessarily want it to be too much of a high fantasy if that makes any sense like I still wanted it to feel like these are real people experiencing human issues but in terms of magical system I kind of picked I didn't say kind of I don't know why I said kind of I I picked the I want to say the race of or like the species of yeah druids because if you are a fan of like greek mythology or like mythology in general i remember in high school i would like read about myths and i would notice and i'm sorry i'm going to say like an aggressive word i would notice that druids or nymphs would be they're not the same thing but like same archetype of being they would be used often in myths and fables but they'd be used as like Zeus would come down as a swan and rape this nymph and then she gave birth to a hero and then fuck her whatever we're not going to talk about her anymore and I just would sit there in high school I was like wait hold on hold the phone so you mean that creature like that was half tree that could like commune with nature that had all these powers and gifts that's it that's where her story ends is just like being I would call them like it's a part of the book too like a conduit to a hero and I, I really wanted to talk more about like of that race, if that makes any sense of being. So we're in a village, that's the species of magical creatures we're working with. And yeah, a lot of my magical system is based on the elements and like earth, water, fire, air. And a lot is based on just like biblical story and like the concept of creation and God. And like also in the in the polar opposite of that, So if there is a God and something greater, there has to be something worse and something evil. And a lot of that comes from the fact that like, I personally think that as human beings, I think this also comes to the fact that I like, I studied psychology when I was in college. And if I wasn't going into film, I was going to go towards the FBI route because I always find it very fascinating that I don't condone bad actions. I just find it fascinating that a human being could make such a heinous choice. Yeah, you explore the the icky matter. Wow, gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, that's my yes. beautiful term. <laughs> yes. Okay, so tell me a little bit about the characters. Who are who are we following in this? Who are the people that we love and hate? So I love this. So you kind of love and hate everyone. Okay. So the way that I was thinking about this in the, in the sense of like this world is it's fantasy. It's definitely quest based a bit like in the sense of like what is the main um conflict it is like man versus society and it's also man versus nature but the main players it's a multiple pov book and so the main players are going to be proctor seamus astrid rebecca rose veronica and mary and i'll break it down like who is who okay yeah yeah essentially these are all like members of this village and they all kind of intertwine into what the magic system is that holds Diagnamore apart from the rest of society. So the mem, and I, I can't say too much without like ruining the actual book, yeah. but the people we're dealing with are like, so Seamus is a healer. He is the village doctor. And what we do know and what I'll tell you is that at the start of Diagnamore, there is an illness sweeping over the village that they cannot find a cure for. They don't know where it's coming from. They don't know if it's airborne. They don't know if, like how people are getting contagious by it. It started off with the elderly and now it is trickling down to the young. Like they're finding people in the birthing unit who are starting off with a cough. And he is very distraught because he wants to help people. He comes from a long line of healers and he lost his best friend to this illness. 
I will now go to his sister, Mary. So Mary is on the village guard. She's actually the head of the village guard. And what they are is like the hunters of the village. So there were many attacks on the village years and years and years ago. There haven't been since. And a part of this, like the reason why that is the case is because I kind of want to use the symbolism of, um, I don't know if you've ever seen The Village by M. Night Shyamalan. No, but I know what it is. Okay, okay. So like, I, without giving any details of that movie, I like fear mongering. I think people okay. are easily controlled when they're afraid of an outside force. Absolutely. And so I think it'd be interesting if you were in the mind of one of these guard members where they're like, I've been out there. There's nothing out there. The issue is in here. It's not out there. Um, and their brother and sister, big, big fan of them because her like loved one. So like she starts off the book very lost because her lover, like the man of her dreams, the man that she was always in love with, he is the one who dies before this book starts. And he's kind of like the central friend of all these people. They all were in a friend group together and separated after the death of Gideon. So mm -hmm. yes. Uh, no, yeah, I, was like, like, I just love the idea of like, I feel like the after is always so interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's also like where this comes from. And that's why I think I wanted to make more human characters is because at the end of the day, like I've been trying to like figure out like, how do I describe, I'll go back to the characters in a second, but like, I've been trying to figure out how do I describe the genre of this book? And it's definitely fantasy romance, 100%. But more than anything, um, it's a dissection on the conversation of grief. Every single one of these people that I'm about to tell you about, like they've experienced grief or are on the brink of it. And they're kind of dealing with that. So they are facing down the bullet of death and like the end of their society. And it's just how different people would approach that. So with Seamus, he's more very active about it. He's like, I can, he almost has a God complex. He's like, I can fix this. I can change this if I was just better. Um, and Mary is very much like defeatist. Like she used to be very perfectionist. She used to be a person that like was very like Probably first ask questions later but after she lost Gideon she's like what the fuck is the point there is none this is worthless so this is like my brother sister duo on the side okay. um Proctor is my schoolhouse perfect like teacher he has my heart um he's like the I, loving I as soon as you said his name I was like okay we like Proctor yes we love Proctor we love him so much and what's funny is like it's so funny like I don't know if this is a question that's going to happen later but like iterations iterations of different drafts right how people shift and change um I'll get to it at a later date but Proctor has become a manifestation tool for me in many ways because I was like well how do I make book talk and the worst of the world but how do I make readers fall in love with this man um, I had never done that before. I'd never written a character that you fall in love with. And I realized, well, what if I just like made him everything I, I wanted a man to be for me? And surefire I, way. It really is a surefire yeah. way to get us hooked. So like he he's not your typical sarcastic bad boy. I'll be honest, he's a soft boy, but he he is a soft boy in in what like the yin to the yang of his of his um romantic counterpart is what Got I'm trying it. to say. Okay. Um so he is very sweet and I can't tell you what's gonna happen with him. So I'm gonna let that be quiet. So okay. the proctor is beautiful. I will then go to Veronica. Veronica is our main protagonist. She's our MC of this care of this world. They're all in their 20s by the way. This is like an NA world. Okay. By, yeah. Um she is a cleric so she has a vow of chastity she works um in the religious sector of this community she works right under their like village leader which is the high priestess and she is kind of next in line to take over once the high priestess like either passes away from the illness or just simply retires and so she's going to take on like all of, like the um she's a spiritual leader of this village and so she has ha kind of given over her entire life to a very peaceful, tranquil existence in which she has, she is submitted to a higher power. Like she truly believes that there is something bigger and better out there for her in this world, mainly because she comes from very humble beginnings. She comes from like, all we really know of her family is that her father was a bit of a drunk. Um, to the extent of that, 
we're not really sure. I'm sure. But um, she likes to keep things very under wraps, especially when you're in her own mind. She's very in control of her own thoughts. And her mother um, was just far too young to be a mother and was taken far too young to get to know too well. And so she was kind of gifted, I guess you could say, with the responsibility of taking care of her little sister, Rebecca Rose, who is 10 years her junior. And so Why is that the most younger sister name I've ever heard in my entire <laughs> life. <laughs> yep. Well, it's funny about that is that the, that's the name of both of my grandmas combined, Rebecca and Rose. I love that. Thank you. Thank you. And so, yeah, so it's like a siblings dynamic in that, in that regard. And, um, and then who else do I have to leave with you? Oh, and then Astrid is my side character. And then I won't tell you too much about Rebecca Rose for right now, but I'll tell you about Astrid. She's kind of like my side character. She is, I can already tell you right now, it's probably me everyone's favorite because she's my favorite. She's very bubbly. She's very beautiful. Um, she's kind of like a Christina Hendricks type with like an Emily Browning kind of mix. And the, right, thank you. That just like very like um, the feminine on ingenue. She, she's going to come across as a manic pixie dream girl with so much depth. So like the way you meet her is not who she actually is. And there's a point to that in a way, but yeah. I was gonna say, it's literally who we all want to be. I feel like like that is who we all aspire to be. Yes. I love that. Okay. So we have the rundown. Um, now what you started talking about it a little bit of like, just like different iterations and manifestations of uh, in your characters, but are you one of those authors that are like, my character is telling me to do this with them? Or like, I had a plan, but this is not what they want to do. Like, is that something for you? Yes. Yes, oh. actually. Um, yes. And yes. And so <laughs> I'll give an example. So like with Astrid and Mary, I had many drafts in which they were best friends. They were thickest thieves, best friends with a secret, but in my recent draft, it's so odd because I had a lot more characters that I, I'm a big believer that if you have too many characters and a few of them are one note, you should cut those characters down, mix them and put them together. So Astrid was actually two different characters at the beginning, a character named Anthem and another character named Agatha. And I loved both of them so much, but I just felt like both of them on their own were kind of weak. And every time I cut to Anthem, I felt like it was taking away from Agatha's story. And I was like, oh my God. It's because they should just be one person. And when that happened, I was writing a scene recently for, it was the first scene we were gonna have Mary and Astrid together where they're very grumpy sunshine, like Mary being the grumpy, Astrid being the sunshine. And I realized in that moment, oh, these two people would have actually never have had a reason to interact before now. And and I gave them, I gave them a reason, like they, they first met a couple scenes back, but this is like their solo scene together. And I was like, oh, this is them becoming friends. This is them becoming friends. I think this is going to be Astrid giving Mary a lifeline. And it all ties back to the secret that Astrid has. Um, it's kind of like, you know how like in acting, it's like, what's your super objective? Yeah. Okay, so Astrid has a super objective and I realized it might just be stronger if they were actually on two, you know, when you're in high school and you have like a big friend group, mm -hmm. but maybe you're on two separate sectors of that friend group. So you kind of know each other, but you're not that close. Right. You've never like sought each other out for a conversation, but you've been at the same parties. That's yeah. Right. yeah. Like if there was like a Scooby-Doo, like everyone split up, it'd be really weird if these two people like paired up. Yes. So this is the scene where these two people are going to pair up Got it. and there's a deeper meaning to it later on. And it's mainly because this friend group has crumbled that maybe they need to come together now. Um, so that happened. And then in terms of like Proctor and just like Seamus and Veronica have been the most consistent. I will say that. Um, but Proctor, it's so the first draft of this was very damning, I'd say, because I used the first draft of this book very much as like therapy. I know that you've said this recently that you write short stories for like how you're feeling about things. Yeah. I just like when I have a really strong emotion, instead of like, I would rather write a story that is that emotion than journal about the emotion. Like for some reason, it is different yeah. for me to like, let's create a world for this emotion and I'll put it there instead of like yeah feeling so because I'll overthink and overanalyze myself like to the nth degree so it's like let us put this in a world that doesn't feel so like ostracizing in a way yeah this isn't Maggie this is just another human being that I can empathize for exactly honestly same 
And that's why when I read that about you, when I read that about you on like her, on your Instagram stories, I don't know why I looked over here as if this is like, but when I read that about you on your Instagram stories, I felt such kindred spirits in that moment. Cause the first draft of this book was very much that it was like kind of dealing with, I had fallen very deeply in love with someone in college and it ended very poorly and a lot came out from that. And so the reason I keep saying like secret, secret, secrets is that it, some of that still stems from the first draft. But Proctor in the first draft is a very damning character. That um, you are in love with? Like, no, so wait, this is what okay. happened. So you fell in love. Got it, got so it. This is what happened. This is what happened. So the whole purpose of the first draft Proctor was that I wanted you to fall in love with this character for him to break your heart. And then I realized, yes, yes, that was so... Okay. I, I realized how mean that was. And I, as I went through the drafts, went through the drafts, went through the drafts, I wanted to fall more in love with this character I wanted to feel deeper for him and as I felt deeper for him and as I started writing him with a kinder light I was like oh no this is not how I'm gonna break people's hearts um and yeah do it in a different way <laughs> do it in a different way and so Proctor became and his relationship with Veronica became everything good that I'd ever wanted and I stripped away a lot of that negativity from the first draft. So basically first draft Proctor and fifth draft Proctor, totally different people. They would not even recognize each other, but um, yeah. That's, I love that. But I also, it makes me curious. Are you one of those people who actually likes the drafting and the editing process? Or are you like, yeah. I spit it out. I don't want to look at it. So yes. And so I love, I have to edit and I have to outline but I will spit it out if, cause I overthink too. I'm just like you in that sense. Like I will stare at a computer screen and especially if I'm on like any hormonal issue, um, <laughs> exact, I will sit there and I'll be like, oh, I'm garbage. This is awful, blah, blah, blah. And so I have to just like, there's like a quote that I watched re that I came across recently. I think it's an atomic habit. It's like, I'd rather be good and have something than try to be perfect and have nothing. And so that's when the vomiting comes out where I'm like, okay, just put it out there and then I'll go back and edit. Yeah, no, I think the hardest part I've realized recently is like the hardest part of doing anything is starting. Like that has just been so resonant with me. Like um, just like with, I, I, I feel like I, yeah, I talked to you about, I recently started my own business and I yeah. have thought about it for so long. And I was just like, you have to just start doing things for it. You can't just like keep thinking about it and like outlining and, and just like, um, making lists and do doing to do's. It's like, you actually have to start accomplishing things. And then as soon as you do the growth that happens, as soon as you sit down and do it is it's like exponential. All of a sudden you're like six drafts in or for you, I'm sure. But like, for me, it was like, oh, I'm already like, I'm already working with clients and I know the better way to do this. Like you just learn so quickly when you actually get started. 1000%. And it's like the scariest thing in the world to just like act. Yeah. But then I thought about it. Like I thought about it in the sense of, and I'm not trying to be cheesy at all, but I thought about it in the sense of like the fantasy characters we love where it's like, you know how sometimes they'll act without thinking and you think, oh my God, that's so risky. That's so dumb. It's honestly a great lesson. It's a great okay. lesson for like people like you and I, or like just people in general, like you could spend your whole life planning and planning is great. Like be cautious, whatever. I'm, I'm sure you needed a business plan before you started anything. But the second you put yourself out there, Maggie, I'm assuming the whole world was like, uh, yeah, I would love to use you. Cause I know you're good at what you do. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's, yeah. It's just like, it was the sort of thing that I, when you said you could spend your whole life planning, I was like, wow, I literally could. I like, avoid doing things by making lists about doing things all the time yeah. um, so I, I'm glad that I, you're in that with me um, but do you edit your own stuff do you have other people look at it how do you feel about people reading your writing do you have an editor that sort of thing so that's actually a great question so in January January 1st of 2022 I kind of did something a little scary for me this is actually a perfect segue so the week before January, I was like super sick. I was super sick. I was on my monthly. I was like in a bad place and I was writing in my bed and my sister was home and I just got so down on myself and I was just like being so mean to myself. And my sister was like, well, let me read it. And I flipped out. I was like, no, no, you can't read it. I, I refuse. Even though I always pitch stuff to her. I, I, she's my number one audience tester. But, um, and she said something to me. She was like, Samantha, you've been writing this for a year and you're the only one that's ever read it. So how can you be the only one who's ever critiqued it? 
Like, how can you be the one that's like the master and commander if it's good or not? Um, and so I did something that was a little like, so I'm an extremist. And so if I can't let anyone read it, I have to let everyone read it, right? I can't just let one person read it. That'd be ridiculous. And so I put up a random one. I think it's chapter four. I put up chapter four on Wattpad and it's like the introduction of my character, Mr. Hooves. I don't think I put him in the lineup actually. He didn't, I, but I remember reading about him. Yes, it's because you don't get into his POV. He, okay. He's only in, he only exists as in, as a, as a counterpart to Veronica, which okay. it's so Philistine that I didn't say anything because they're my favorite characters. But basically I did that as a full like rip off the bandaid, if you will. Like I have to let everyone try to read this in order for me to feel comfortable at the place of being like, you know what, you are in the place to let people read this. And so now I I am currently looking for an editor, like a neutral, like someone who actually does this for a living editor. Um, because I do have a couple of beta readers that are lined up, like people that have told me that they want to do it. Uh, and this year, not this year, that sounds like far away. We're in January. Mm -hmm. I'm hoping by the end of February to like have this out in the if not earlier have this out in the hands of beta readers and then move into an editor so yes I'm very big on critique I'm very big on feedback I think I just after a while I, I think I got super used to getting critique and feedback in terms of like scripts like does that make any sense like yeah like I, I would seek it out like I used to be a part of a writer's group where every month I would write 30 pages of TV pilot or a script or something like that have it up on its legs and have a whole room of people tell me their thoughts on it and so I'm very used to the critique system but then when it came to a book I think I just got way too into the vacuum of my own mind so well, yeah a, I feel like a book is so different from a script like there are so many times where I've started to write a script and I would have my screenwriting professor would look at me and she goes this is a novel this is not a script and just because she, and not in the way that I like not in the actual like I don't know aspects of it but the way the story was being told yeah. it, he was just like this is not meant for film and I'm like it's just they're two different things and they're also uh, for me books are harder to share like for like scripts are so much more clinical in a sense um they have to have that story arc obviously but like there is something about novels that are just so intimate that it's like it's scarier to let, let go of I, think. I I love you right now and I feel so validated by you because I had a couple of my film friends read my I was well more than anything back to what you were saying in terms of like when you take that first step like the leaps and bounds I was so afraid of sharing just one chapter from my book. Um, I just got the biggest warm hug from the community, like the biggest warm hug. And then from people who aren't even a part of book talk, who I didn't even think were going to read it. Like I have like friends who play soccer professionally who, who read it and like, were like, wow, I don't read fantasy. This is not my thing, but whoa, this is like the, th these words. And I had friends of mine from film talking about clinical who were like, oh my God, I'm realizing now how different the style of prose to film is because film, so the way that film schools teach screenwriting, as you know, is like, it is not supposed to be this like literal, like lyrical piece of work. It is a, is a manual that the entire casting crew can read and go, okay, scene one, girl walks in wearing a blouse into a coffee shop. It is this time of day, awesome. You know, like that it's supposed to be like a step-by-step -step just manual that anyone can read and we all get the same page. Pros are like, I felt the taste of the, you know what I mean? It's it's wild how personal and intimate that can be and how every word makes a difference. Right, but it's so, it's so, I mean, they're two different experiences, both of which I love in their own way. But I mean, I think it's so cool that you get to explore this. And then also, I mean, you, you're you exploring it. Like you said, it's, it was a warm hug when you released it. You have this entire community that is like kind of cheering you on as you write. Like, what is that experience like? Because I feel like that is so rare unless you're an established author. Like nobody is like, I don't know, like basically on the sidelines for you as you like emerge onto this, into this industry. Well, what's funny is like, I, yesterday I posted a character's video on my Instagram page, no, on my TikTok, I, I like posted like a little cute, like here, meet my characters, which I had never done before. 
And instantly I got very beautiful comments um, from people who have been like, when you said Diagonal More, it killed me. I was like, oh my God, another person that's not in my mind knows this book exists and knows how to say it properly. And I listed one of my characters, Rebecca Rose, and I write Rebecca with one C because it's an homage to my grandma. She writes her name with one C and this care. And one of these people, um, commented on the video going, oh my God, I can't wait to protect Rebecca Rose with all my heart. She's like a little girl. And she wrote it with two C's and then she came back and went, oh wait, and corrected it with one C. And I don't know why that made me cry. I sort of like had tears in my eyes just because I was like, wow, not only are you being kind and supporting me, but you also paid attention to the detail of that. And we're like, oh, Samantha clearly didn't, ha clearly didn't have like a typo. That was a choice. Um, and I don't know, I think it's really cool just like, the amount of people who have told me that the chapter I released of Veronica is very intimate. And, it, and the reason I released that is because it gives a very good slice of who her character is and how wrong she feels. And a lot of people were very connected to her and were very connected to Mr. Hooves, who, to be honest, they're probably like my favorite pairing of characters. Mm -hmm. um, and I just felt very safe. I don't know how to describe it. I'm so lucky. I'm so grateful. Yeah, I feel like there are a million ways that that could have gone. But I mean, it's yes. <laughs> It's hard enough when like, when someone tells you like, how are you going to be the only one that's going to read this? And it's like, <clears throat> it's so hard to hear um, because like, obviously you're going to get people to read it, but you didn't even like, but you don't want to share it. Like it's just, exactly. <laughs> it's like this very weird, uh, yeah, crossover, but I'm glad that you, I mean, I loved reading it. I was, I know yeah. that I talked to you and was able to read it and it was such a cool insight into your brain because I feel like you talk a lot about being fascinated with, um, well, truly like with the cult, like world with death, with grief, with like, just like these dark matter subjects that are, but you have a very like pragmatic and logical brain as well as a creative brain. And so it's kind of like talking about it in a way that is just like very transparent. And I think that that's so, I don't know, it's just rare because we don't really deal with, I mean, in most fantasy novels, they're like, we're going on an adventure instead of like, we're dealing with some tough shit. Um, which yeah, I, I will say like in terms of Diagnomor, in terms of like what you're going to receive in Diagnomor, we're dealing with tough shit. Um, everyone, so Mary's form of like this is how everyone's like expression of grief is. So like Mary's form of grief is like, you know, she's gonna chase it down the bottom of a bottle and she's going to explode and she's gonna implode her perfect life. And Seamus is gonna throw himself into his work to the degree of like being extremely unhealthy and like productive to the sense of destruction astrid um is trying to find penance before anything could happen and like almost um you know how someone goes to a priest and confesses all their things all their sins that's kind of what astrid's on her path to do in ways that you never imagined someone like her could do proctor is trying to live out a fantasy one last time before it's all over for him and rebecca rose never thought she'd have a future. And now she's being thrust into one that maybe she's not ready for, and maybe no one ever would be ready for. And at the flip side of her and her sister's eyes, her sister is dealing with the grief of having a future stripped from her while also going back and healing the inner child she never paid attention to. And so she's having like this disassociative thoughts. Um, and I, I'm trying to play with the concept of disassociation in a way uh, that is respectful because when when Veronica sees Mr. Hooves, she is not psychotic and she's not going through manic episodes. Mr. Hooves for me, um, basically I came up with Mr. Hooves and the concept of, of a grown woman having an imaginary friend because when I was a little girl, I was very, very lonely and and consider the fact that Diagonal Moore's original main protagonist was Rebecca Rose. And when she, when this was originally written and Veronica was the antagonist. Oh my gosh. Yes, That's I didn't so see cool. that. Okay. Yeah, thank you. It was completely flipped. And then I realized as I got older, I was like, oh my God, Veronica has the cooler storyline in this. <laughs> She's like much more and I, I can understand her more. And so I'm actually really grateful. I never pursued it when I was little. I think I needed to have some life experience. Um, 
And so right now this little girl is the antagonist of this world, even though she doesn't realize it. And, um, but, but when I was little, I, I don't know if you remember this movie. I watched Don't Look Under the Bed. Oh, Did you ever see that? I, yeah, and I didn't, I don't ever want to see it again. It was it like, was horrifying. yeah. But like, essentially, so you remember the plot, like, like, what's it, like the concept? Yes. Okay, so like the boogeyman is essentially what happens to your imaginary friend when you stop believing in him. Yeah. Did you have an imaginary friend? Yes, for a very long time. My brother stressed, like, literally there's this story that they always tell at like random, I don't know, when my parents like meet someone new of my friends. And it's always like, there was this time when Maggie was like, 13 and like in her bedroom like just sitting on the bed and I was talking it was probably younger than that but I still think that I had her for a while and my brother walks by and I'm just like on my bed talking to the wall and he runs down stairs and he goes mom dad Maggie's talking to somebody and there's nobody there and it's Whoa. Just, but I yeah I loved her her name was Feline like in Bambi yeah wait wait repeat that her name was what her name was Feline like from Bambi Feline. Yeah, oh, it's pretty. I haven't seen Bambi in years because it's sad. <laughs> yes, it um, is. But like that, like conceptually that. So first of all, I totally agree that she might have been, that you might have been 13. Why the hell not? Um, I My character is like 23. But the, the, reason, the reason why I'm so fascinated by that is because I'm so jealous of you for that. Because I saw this movie when I was a little girl and I was so lonely. And I was like, wait, hold the phone. You're telling me people were making up friends? <laughs> You, you told me that was like a thing you could do was make up friends. And I think that's why I started writing and reading so much was like to make up friends. And I was trying so desperately to make up an imaginary friend. I was like, I see a bear man. I didn't see shit. I'm so sorry for cursing. You can bleep that out, but I'm cursing. You're fine. Okay. Okay. Magic. So, but like, so I thought to myself, so, so fast forward. So now that we've flipped this world and our protagonists have shifted. Now I'm looking more into the eyesight of Veronica. And I realized, oh my gosh, this character is so alone. Like she's very alone in this perfect ideal of what she's created for herself. And her pride is her sin horribly. And I think second to that would be greed. Um, not greed, envy. Envy is definitely her second sin. And I just realized, I think what happened was this. And I think that's also why chapter four of this book is so important to me. And Veronica is so important to me is that um, I realized one day I was like in my house in California, I live with beautiful roommates, but I spend most of my time inside because I don't have a car. I, I work from home. I, I'm always in my room. And I just had this like when I, when I write for too many days in a row, I get very introspective and I just started bawling my eyes out. I started crying and I was so lonely. And I realized this is not something that I can just call up a friend and just like tell them like what's on my mind. Not that I couldn't, it's just that like, why would I? And I realized that the only other person I can connect with that would feel this way is Veronica. And so I took my diary journal of like, why not me? And I made that into the scene where she meets Mr. Hooves because I was like, I think that one person, I know that children have imaginary friends, but I don't think we think about the loneliness and perfection of being an adult in that way. And so what if this grown woman that's not going through a psychosis or anything like that, what if she really just needed someone who was in her corner that was a neutral entity and that was her rock? And so that's where Mr. Hooves comes from. Jeez. Yeah. I remember reading that and I was just like, just the way, like almost the, the desperation, um, that comes across there. Um, I, I think that so many of us can relate to it, but it's not something that we really talk about because that's not nice to talk about. And everybody exactly. has their own like opinion. And like, it's the same thing with the whole, like, it, I kind of saw this in euphoria the other day when I was watching an episode, but it's just like the whole self-love culture is like for people who are really struggling with depression and they feel terrible about themselves and can't get out of bed for someone to be like, you know, just love yourself and treat yourself well. And it's like, okay, but you're not stuck in bed. You like, you don't understand. I can't just love myself through this right now. Like, it, it's just like, a, yeah, it feels like, yeah, they're just, they well, miss the mark a little bit. So how Veronica would perceive that is that like, you know how there was, there was a 60 minutes article that episode when I was in high school with Shakira and my dad watched this. I know this is so specific, but my dad watched this and he told me I watched this thing with Shakira um, and she said that she never once in her life 
ever doubted that she was going to be famous. And that scarred me in the weirdest way. Cause I was like, so what does that mean if I ever doubted it? So then like in, like, does that mean I'm not going to succeed because I have doubt implicitly in my, in my being? So basically Veronica is kind of me making fun of toxic positivity in a big way too, where she wants to be on level on par with godliness. Like she wants to be this perfect being and, but deep down inside of herself, there's a lot of self-loathing that she masks with this like positive, positive energy. And that's where Mr. Hooves is coming from. And by the end of the book, she will have found, you know, like she will have hugged the inner child and like gotten back together with herself. But at the very, very start of it, that's where Mr. Hooves is coming in from. It's like, well, you can't be perfect and you can't pretend everything is okay because there's all of this under the surface that you are clearly ignoring that we need to deal with first. Right. No, I mean, I'm curious, is there like if you had to say the one reason you wrote this book or the one thing you really wanted to get across with this uh, being like the first book full length book that you've read, I mean, that you've written, what, what would that be for you? I think two, this is twofold. So I mentioned the grief, right? So grief for me takes on many iterations. So there's the grief of like, you didn't get your dream job. And then there's the grief of, I lost the love of my life. There's the grief of maybe my days are numbered. Um, the ending of things. I feel like we as a society do two things that I find so irritating, which is we don't talk enough of the awkward period. I call it the second puberty. We don't talk enough of the, of the awkward period of life post-grad and life starting off as an adult of like what it really means to achieve your dreams, how you get there and the anger one might feel of not getting there yet. So that's on one sector. And on the opposite sector, um, maybe you can buy me on this, maybe not. I don't want to touch anything, but as a, this is kind of part of the subject. I think that we don't talk about grief enough as a society. Like if you lost someone, I think we come from this like toxic perspective as a culture where it's like, well, you have to move on. We don't want to talk about it anymore. We don't want to remember it anymore the clock keeps spinning, the world keeps spinning. And this person you've lost isn't here anymore. Like, no, I, I don't want to think about it. And a lot of my characters, specifically Mary, is very, that's bullshit. That's bullshit. There is no, there is no sands of time that tells me when I have to get over losing someone when every day I wake up and I feel hollow inside. Yeah. Jeez, yeah, I was actually, um, this is, it's going to sound random, but have, probably you, have you ever seen the real people movie, Jack Frost with Michael Keaton? Not in years. Should okay. I? Yeah. You should rewatch it because I rewatched it recently and I look back on it and I was like, this was maybe the only film I ever watched as a kid that dealt with grief. Like it, it talks about this kid losing his father. And like, obviously if you haven't seen the movie, his father was reincarnated as Jack Frost in the form of a snowman. And it sounds ridiculous, but I, it is so beautifully done, so well done. I was like, I was watching it with like another person my age and I was like, and they had never seen it before. And they were like, you, you watch this as a kid and I was like man I don't know if it was my parents or who but they were so smart like to be able it was just like how to deal with grief at that age like at at 11 um and like kind of what that's like um because I, I I look back and I'm just like I don't I don't we don't really deal or we don't talk about a lot of how to deal with grief, especially as a young kid. Like we, we, we run away if you're a child. And then uh, those are like two, um, two taboo subjects. The after graduation thing is also like, it's almost half the time it's, we don't talk about it. The other half, it's like, it's a secret. Nobody wants to like talk about how they do it once they get there. And I'm just like, why are we gatekeeping this? <laughs> It's, 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 it's wild to me. Cause I would feel so much more comfortable because like, 
I watch, so first of all, I'm definitely gonna watch that immediately because grief as a subject is very, very important to me. We don't talk about it. And it's the one thing that connects us all as people. Um, and like, I go to like film festivals or like we, like I hear actors and all they say is like, yeah, I graduated from conservatory, blah, blah, blah. And then at 30, it's like, so what happened in those 10 years? Even, even in the Bible, like Jesus disappears and like comes back at 32 and is like, I am the Messiah. <laughs> like, and I, I just find that so funny and nobody wants to talk about it. And I want to talk about it. And I, and that's it. I also that's love, basically it. Uh, yeah. I was about to say, I also enjoy like when I get here, like I've had some people ask me like, how did you move to the city? How did you get like an agent? How did you get a manager? And I will literally get on the phone with them and I'll be like, this is my step-by-step -step how I got there. And wow. I just I, I like doing that because I had someone who did that for me. And yeah. I'm like, I would not have been able to do this without knowing any of that information. So yeah, I, 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 I feel like it's a pay it forward thing, but it's not very, Maggie, that's very beautiful. That's very mature and kind. And, <laughs> and that is like a karmic good. I don't know how to explain that. Like, that's just like, like no one's forcing that. That's just very nice. People don't do that. That's really nice. Well, I just feel like, I don't know, I feel kind of the responsibility to because I also was helped. I, I do very much believe in the pay it forward kind of motion. So um, yeah, I'm, I'm really excited about this book. I have to say, I'm very excited for everything to come out. I am, I'm curious a little bit what you, what, like, what are your hopes for with this book? Do you want to try and self-publish? Do you want to try and send it to an agent? What is, what is your, is it just kind of like a, um, you're not really sure yet? Like hit me with what your thoughts are. So I am going to self-publish. Originally, I wanted to publish like through an agency. And then I was basically helping a friend of mine query and that whole process. This is my first novel. And I do believe in this novel. I, I love this novel so much, but I do kind of believe in the power of book talk more than anything. Mm -hmm. And so my, my thing is this, I kind of just want full control over the first thing I ever put out into the world. And then from there on after, I would love to get a literary agent. If I get a literary agent from this, that'd be amazing. I just kind of, I think I just need one thing that's 100% my own before anything else. And that's why, so my, my, big, my big thing that I'm looking for right now is an editor, because uh, I do believe in the concept of community and like working together. And then a cover writer, or like not a cover writer, a cover artist. I'm looking for a cover artist for this book, but I want to put it out. I want to put it out in this year. I have like a fire under me right now. I have a couple of things that are like very open to me in the world. That I'm very grateful for because like, as I've mentioned throughout this whole podcast, it's very hard post-grad. So when you do get good things, they're gorgeous, gorgeous material. Um, so yeah, that's kind of my whole thing is I kind of want this to be the gift that's between me and book talk. Yeah. Yeah. And where, um, what can people do to support you right now? How, how can we, yeah. On this is how you can support me. I, if you know of anyone who would be a good cover artist, if you would know of anyone that'd be a good editor for fantasy, hit me up, DM me over Instagram. I would love to work with them because I'm kind of in a vacuum right now. I'm not really on Twitter. Um, and I'm just trying to find the best person that could work for me. I've been on Fiverr and stuff, but I also don't know anyone. So I'm kind of like, I'm, I'm nervous and I'm shy. And I think I just trust this community more than anyone else. And so, yeah, if you know of anyone that would work well with that, you heard kind of the story so far, please let me know. I'm very open to it. And I'm always checking my DMs, so. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for chatting with me today. This was so much fun. And I'm really excited to just sort of follow this as it goes and have the whole, I mean, the whole community's back in you. So yeah, I can't wait to read it. Thank you. I can't wait to give it to you. So <laughs> awesome. Okay. Thanks guys. If you want to like, and subscribe, if you want to see some more authors talk about their books from book talk, um, but that's all for today.